Well, good morning, church, and welcome to worship this morning for Multnomah Presbyterian Church. It's good for us to be here today in worship, giving all honor, all glory, all praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. My name is Danny Peters. I'm the pastor of MPC, and I want to ex extend a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today. If you're new to our community, whether you're joining us live here on Zoom or whether you're joining us later on through our YouTube channel, we are grateful for your presence with us today. Now, next Sunday, October 18th, is what we're calling Southwest Church Together Sunday. Now, if you remember last year, MPC forged a partnership with three other churches here in Southwest per Portland, which are Greater Portland Bible, Misio, and Riversgate Church. And we're calling this partnership Southwest Church Together. And uh, really the whole purpose of it is to support one another um, in our common calling to bring the hope of the gospel um, here to our city. So uh, last October, um, if, uh, I know many of you were there when our four churches came together um, all in one joint worship service, which was, which was wonderful. And this year we're not able to join together in that way, but next week as part of our worship service, we will be having a collaborative children's lesson as well as a sermon. Um, so that's next Sunday, October 18th, right here at 1030. Nothing changes as far as our, our worship goes. You'll use the same link for, for worship that we've been using the past several weeks. Now this Thursday, I'm really excited to be kicking off our book study on Jamar Tisby's The Color of Compromise. So we're going to be meeting Thursday night, 715 on Zoom. And there's still time to register for that uh, study if you'd like to do that. If you'd like to sign up, you can use the link that's in the October announcer or you can send me an email as well. Now also, we're going to be putting together a virtual worship bulletin that will be sent out every Friday. And in that bulletin will be um, our order for worship and also more information about upcoming events. So keep an eye out for that email at the end of each week. And we also have the opportunity today, friends, to worship the Lord through our, through our giving. We give back to the God who, who gave up everything for us. We worship and we serve a, a generous God. And if you'd like to make a financial contribution to MPC, as always, you can do so through our website at moltpresschurch.org or through the mail by sending checks to our church office. And we really do serve a great God that is providing for us in, in amazing and incredible ways. And I just wanna uh, take this moment to say thank you to those of you who are, uh, who are serving in that way, uh, not only contributing financially, but also um, giving time, talent, prayer. We are so grateful uh, for the MPC family. And now, friends, let's, uh, let's turn our attention to Jesus. Let's do what we came here to do, which is worship him. Our opening song will be open up the heavens. And uh, so let's join, join together um, in that. Friends, let us worship God together. Mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every 
sin or to shame, we are defying in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Hey, MPC kids, and hey, MPC. Uh, we are still looking through the book of Revelation, but like Danny said, next week we are going to have a special Sunday where we join with some of the other churches. So watch for an email in your email box uh, because I am going to be asking for some pictures of you guys to put into a story, kind of like we put the helm and pets into Bible stories. We need some pictures of our MPC kids to go along with the pictures of the other kids. Uh, so that you guys can be in a Bible story next week for our children's lesson. But today, we're still talking about the book of Revelation, and there's still a lot of crazy stuff in that book. And so once again, we have another Val's Lab, and I have Val with me today, but we have another Val's Lab to help us try and understand Revelation. And we need to thank Judah Haynes so, so much, because he is our amazing editor and graphic designer for all these videos. And it has been so much fun seeing what Judah does with these videos. So let's watch another episode of Val's Lab. Hey Val. Valentine's Laboratory. Silas. I'm reading about the beast. This sounds very scary. Come on, let's go. Oh, okay, okay. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. We gotta get out of here. No, we don't. There's no. a beast. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. I saw it. No. In the book. No. Okay, you guys, you don't have to be afraid of the beast, okay? Like the beast that they're talking about in Revelation, it's not a real beast that's coming to get you. It's kind of a crazy looking beast though. It's what it has the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear seven heads with like 10 horns and 10 crowns. What do you think of that guy? Pretty crazy. But the beast is just anything that, like back in the day, it could have been a ruler that said that he was like God and he wanted everyone to worship him. In fact, that's probably why John was on that island getting that vision is because he refused to worship the ruler of the time, the emperor, as if he was a God. And the beast represents anything that is taking up all our thoughts, maybe like something that we're really worried about, like you were so worried about the beast, you forgot that Jesus is with you and no matter what's coming, he would protect you, right? If you let your yeah. worries yeah. make you forget that God was with you. And that is making the thing that you're afraid of too important. It's making it something we call an idol. Have you ever heard of an idol before? American Idol. Uh, yeah, like American Idol. Idol is somebody that we look up to or a thing that we look up to that or thing. just what? a thing that we think about way too much because sit here. Sit here we're quietly. either worried about it or what's your favorite thing in Val's lab? Me? Yeah, and Silas. What is your favorite thing in Val's lab? Silas, do you have a favorite thing in Val's lab? Uh, yeah. Yeah, what is it? Is this your favorite thing in Val's Lab? The yeah. music machine? Yeah. Well, what if you love this music machine so much that you wouldn't let anyone else play with it because you worried that something would happen to it? So you wouldn't share it with anyone because you just were so worried about something happening to the thing that you loved. That's basically making it an idol too because you're not following God's command to love others and love others by sharing the things that you love, right? So that's the thing that John's warning us about. Not an actual scary monster, but letting anything crowd out our thinking so that we're either too worried or too selfish about it. What? Oh, wait. There's a beast at the it's door. It's the beast. Stop it. It's this Micah. He's not a beast. Micah's <laughs> not a beast. You're right. Micah's not a beast. So we don't have to be worried about Micah either, do we? Mm -mm. And even if Micah turned into a beast, like the Hulk that we talked about last week, who would be with us and help us? 
The Avengers. No, but Jesus. Oh, Jesus. yeah. That's right. Jesus? No. Yep. No, Jesus is not a superpower. He didn't believe it. He's kind of a superhero. He's kind of a superhero. No. Yeah, he can do stuff. He can fly. And he can heal people. And he can make a whole bunch of food out of just a tiny little bit of food. He's got more powers than the Hulk. Yeah, he probably no. is more powerful than the Hulk. No. Hulk can do Hulk mask. <laughs> and that's all he can do. And then he's smart. But he can't make a whole bunch of food out of a little bit of food. And he can't fly up in the sky. And he can't um, heal people. Jesus is better than Hulk. No. Well, thanks so much to, to Val and Heather, Silas, Judah, and Micah, and for all who... Uh, who put together that latest installment of Val, Val's lab laboratory. What a, what a gift and a joy it is to have that as part of our service today. And now friends, we're gonna now step into a, into a time of prayer. And before we do that, I, I wanted to let you know of uh, actually some sad news that we received over the weekend. Uh, yesterday morning, our dear friend and, and sister in Jesus, Ruth Croft um, passed away. And Ruth, as many of you know, was a, a longtime member of our community and a very beloved member of, of MPC. And uh, just recently, about a, uh, last year, went uh, and moved over to Walla Walla, Washington, and uh, has, has, been, has been there for about the past year. But uh, I, I walked into our sanctuary this morning, and one of the first things that I, that I saw was a uh, a beautiful stained glass window that is at the back of our sanctuary, an image of the, the lion and the lamb, which is actually comes from the book of Revelation chapter five. And uh, that window was actually a, a wonderful gift that, uh, that Ruth gave to, to our church. Uh, so what a gift it is to have that permanent fixture there in our sanctuary. And uh, in that way, and in so many others, um, Ruth left a, a wonderful legacy and the way that she loved and the way that she served. And um, I, I wanted to let everyone know that today and, and encourage all of us to be uh, keeping Ruth's loved ones, in particular her, her children um, and, her, and their families in our prayers in the com coming days. And of course, while it's a sad loss for us, we are um, people of hope and, and faith, and we have the firm and, and certain hope that, that Ruth is uh, now at peace in the, in the presence of Jesus. And now we're going to do something actually a little bit different today for our morning prayers. Uh, we're going to uh, do a responsive prayer based on uh, two Psalms that we find in the Bible. And the reality is, friends, that when we gather and when we come together uh, to worship the Lord, we don't always come brimming with hope and with faith and with confidence. That there are times where we come here and we, we bring our, um, our burdens, our, our sorrows um, in our worship of God. And um, all of those things are reflected in, in Scripture um, so in just a moment, I'm going to put up on the screen a, a responsive prayer that we will pray together based on Psalms 13 and 23. And I hope that, uh, that this prayer will be a blessing to you, that it would minister to you um, wherever you find yourself today. Um, so in, in just a moment, uh, give me a moment to put that up on the screen, and then, uh, then I'll lead us in, um, in prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever, how long will you look the other way? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. 
He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Lord, how long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? He restores my soul. He guides me along paths of righteousness for the sake of his good name. Lord, how long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord, my God. Restore the sight to my eyes or I will die. Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Lord, don't let my enemies gloat, saying we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. You prepare a feast for me right in front of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he has been so good to me. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.
Amen. Friends, we are continuing this morning to walk through the book of Revelation, and we just have a couple more weeks to spend in this book. And I realize that this sermon series is really barely scratching the surface of all that is the the book of Revelation. This book is so rich and so powerful, but but I hope that as a result of this service, or or as a result of this series, rather, that the book of Revelation will seem a, a little more accessible to you and perhaps a little bit less intimidating, because up to this point, I have been teaching on some of the more palatable texts from the book of Revelation. And I've made the case that Revelation is poetry. And as readers, we ought to allow ourselves simply to dwell in the beauty and the wonder of these visions. And I I believe that that is true, but, but I also want to acknowledge today that there are parts of this book that don't strike us as being all that beautiful. Right? In fact, there are certain images in Revelation that are downright terrifying, images of, of judgment and violence and warfare, and, and I'm going to address some of these today. You know, years ago, when I lived back east, my wife and I went to see a baseball game at Yankee Stadium, and we were sitting there in our seats, and next to us were three young men who were clearly from out of town. And come to find out, they were visiting from the UK, and they had never seen a baseball game before. And personally, I had been playing and watching baseball for my entire life, so I knew all that was going on. I knew all the rules to the game, and it was all pretty second nature. But these three men from the UK, they had no idea what they were watching. They they weren't familiar with with balls and strikes. They didn't know the different positions on the field. And when the crowd would cheer or when the crowd would boo, they had no idea why. And and then after the the top of the seventh inning, of course, everyone stands up and starts singing, take me out to the ball game. And I'm pretty sure that at that moment, these three thought that Americans were like the weirdest people on earth. From the bewildered looks on their faces, they were clearly wondering what, what is going on here? Right? What is this song that they're singing, and, and, and what is a Cracker Jack anyway? You know, the fact is, if you have never seen a baseball game before, it is not going to make sense. Because the book of Revelation is, is like this. We have to remember that this book didn't just fall from the sky, but this was a letter right, that was written to particular churches at particular times. Um, Most believe that it was written in the late first century, and the original readers of Revelation, or the original hearers, I should say, because Revelation would have been read aloud in public worship, the original hearers would have been very familiar with these images and with all of the symbols that we find here. It would have made sense to them. But for us, the people of God in 2020, this is not the case. It's kind of like watching baseball for the first time, right? We have to work a little bit harder to understand and and comprehend all of what's going on here. To take the book of Revelation and apply it to a 21st century context, it's it's not easy. It's not a, a clear process. And one of the bigger questions that I think we have concerning the book of Revelation is this. Should Revelation be read literally? Right? Perhaps this is something that you're wondering about at this point. Should we take this literally? Is Revelation giving an actual literal description of what's to come? You know, I want to preface the, what I'm about to say with, with this. I take the Bible seriously. And I know you may feel as if that, that should go without saying, but frankly, there are many in my position who, who don't take it as, as seriously, or they dismiss parts of the Bible they don't like or that they don't agree with, but I don't do that. I, I, I take it seriously. I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. I believe it's inerrant and it's revelation. I take it seriously. But there are some voices who claim that to take the Bible seriously means to always read it literally, and, th- and that is just not the case. In fact, I don't know anyone who reads the entirety of Scripture literally. Allow me to explain. In the Gospel of John, you may remember that that Jesus um, says that Jesus uses a series of I am statements. 
in that gospel. I am the, the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the, the gate for the sheep. And as readers of scripture, we, we know from the context here that, that Jesus is not saying that he is literally a loaf of bread or that he is literally a, a grapevine. No, Jesus uses picture language and metaphor to communicate spiritual truth. And the book of Revelation does the exact same thing. And I, I want to highlight one particular image um, from Revelation. Chapter 17, verse 9 says this. Uh, the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. That's Revelation 17, verse 9. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. So, so here we have an image of a woman sitting on seven hills. And now the people of the first century would have understood that John is not referring to a literal woman sitting on seven literal hills but, but in fact, this is picture language. It's, it's metaphor. The woman is a, a personification of the city of Rome, a city that is built upon seven hills. So we need to recognize this when it comes to scripture like Revelation. We, we always take it seriously, but we shouldn't always take it literally. And just because something isn't literal doesn't mean that it isn't true. And when we read the entirety of scripture literal, we, we end up often dis distorting its meaning. It causes a lot of problems. But, but let me say this. There, there are some lines that need to be drawn here because there are places in scripture where we must hold fast to a, a literal reading of scripture. The, the death of, of, and resurrection of Jesus being the, the prime example of this because we believe that Jesus did die a literal death and he was literally raised to, to life, there can be no compromise there. So to be a faithful reader of scripture, we, all, we take it all seriously, but not everything is, is literal. I, I'm not sure if that was helpful or confused you even more, but if, if it's the latter, then send me a message and, and let's talk. Well, this morning, we are looking at uh, Revelation chapter 12, and this is probably one of the, the more puzzling and, and perhaps more disturbing uh, texts in this book. If you have a Bible near you, you can head there, and I'll also put the uh, text up on the screen for us as well. But uh, before, uh, before we get into it, uh, let me pray and ask God to bless this reading of his word. Oh God, we are grateful that you have called us here um, into your presence, and we thank you for this word that we are about to receive from your scriptures. We thank you, Lord, that you are present with us, that the power of your Holy Spirit is, is here and among us. So we ask, God, that you would do now what only you can, which is take these words, take these complicated, confusing, ancient words and breathe life into them and carry them deep into our hearts today. In this we ask, God, as always, in the strong, powerful name, of Jesus, our Lord, who loves us. Amen. As I said, our reading today comes from the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 12, and I'm going to be starting in verse 1. John writes, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Okay, let's, 
let's pause here for a moment and examine exactly what's going on here. Because the setting for this vision is the kingdom of heaven. We learn that right away in verse one. We have, like I said, one of the more terrifying visions in Revelation, an enormous red dragon with, with seven heads, seven crowns, 10 horns. And in another vision, we have a woman, right? A woman who is about to give birth to a child, a child that the dragon is seeking to destroy. Now, many have pointed out here, many scholars, people who know way more than I do, that what we have here is the weirdest version of the Christmas story ever told, right? This is Christmas, Revelation style, right? There's no singing angels or shepherds tending their flocks, but here, but there is the birth of a child, a child who will rule over all of the nations. And John doesn't tell us if the woman is meant to be Mary, the mother of Jesus, or if the dragon is Herod, but clearly Revelation is describing the birth of the Messiah, but, but in more of a cosmic sense. So, so mainly this vision puts before us the reality that when Jesus came into the world, that God was waging a war against sin, sin and evil. So let's continue reading verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times a half a time, out of the serpent's reach. And then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman. By opening its mouth and the dragon, by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So a war is raging in heaven, which in itself is a, a pretty haunting image, right? Because we tend to think of heaven as this very serene, very ethereal realm. But here in Revelation 12, heaven is a battlefield. When this dragon is unable to destroy the child in the early part of the passage, a war breaks out in heaven. There is this cosmic battle, this struggle between good and evil in the heavenly realm. 
And I've said earlier in this series that one of the primary purposes of Revelation is to give us a heavenly perspective on our earthly situation. It's what Revelation does. It gives heavenly perspective on our earthly situation. And and here's what I believe this passage is showing to us today, that, that all of the evil, all of the war, all of the conflict that we see in this world is but a reflection of this cosmic spiritual battle between good and evil. And the Apostle Paul speaks to this in Ephesians chapter 6, that passage where Paul is encouraging the, the church to put on the armor of God. And he says this, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, Scripture is pretty clear that in Revelation and elsewhere that there exists this cosmic struggle between good and evil, justice and injustice, light and darkness. And I don't think any of us would deny the presence or the existence of evil in this world. I don't think anyone would dispute that. G.K. Chesterton was an English writer and a a philosopher, and in in 1908, he was asked to write an essay for the London Times on one of life's biggest questions, and the question was, what is wrong with the world? What is wrong with the world? That was the question he was asked to respond to, and the editors of the newspaper expected this very lengthy and very scholarly piece But instead, what they received back from Chesterton was only a few words. In response to that question, what is wrong with the world? Chesterton wrote this. Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. So what is wrong with the world? I am. You're right, instead of pointing out into the world, right, he pointed at himself, and there's, there's something, something deeply true and profound and, and biblical uh, about this, right? Because when we think about evil, a lot of times we think about it as something that happens out there. But the reality is that, th- that this cosmic battle of good and evil, this struggle, it's not just happening out there, but it's happening within our own hearts, Because here in Revelation 12, in verse 9, the author tells us exactly what this red dragon represents. And this is not always the case with Revelation, right? We don't always know what these visions represent. Uh, But here it is. It says, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan who leads the whole world astray. You see, in the mainline Protestant church, of which we are a part, we, we don't tend to talk about Satan all of that much, and I don't really have a great answer as to why that's the case, but this vision, this vision is something we need to take seriously. And again, I don't believe that this is meant to be literal. I don't think we need to be concerned about a literal seven-headed dragon, but we need to take seriously the biblical reality that there is an adversary that there are dark and demonic forces in this world that are opposed to the goodness of God. And and I know that that this is not a a comfortable thing to to think about or to grapple with, but it's a reality in Scripture that we can't ignore. We have to take it seriously. Because in the latter half of Revelation 12, we see that the dragon is just feeding furiously pursuing this this woman, the one who has given birth to the child. And again, the the dragon fails. He he loses. And, And at the end of the chapter, here it is. It says, the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war on her offspring. And her offspring were those who keep God's command and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. So make no mistake that here in Revelation 12, there is a 
a word to the church, to followers of Jesus in every time and place. And the reality is that those who walk with Jesus will experience spiritual opposition. Because like I said, this struggle between good and evil, it's not just out there, but it's in our own hearts. And there are two primary things. There are two primary things that Satan seeks to do in the lives of Christians. He seeks to accuse us, and he seeks to deceive us. That's what he does. He accuses and he deceives. Satan will do everything possible to convince us that God's love, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's salvation, that these things don't apply to us. The enemy will do everything possible to to misdirect our worship. Everything possible to ensure that we pledge our allegiance to anyone or anything that is not named Jesus. Friends, here's the good news. And yes, yes, there is good news here in Revelation 12 that we can face this passage without fear. And it's for this reason, because right in the middle of this battle scene is a a pronouncement of victory. Listen to this. This is verse 10. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. You see, Revelation reveals this this heavenly battle, this struggle between good and evil. And the good news is that God has already won. That God has already won and Satan has already lost. And at the cross and at the empty tomb, Jesus overcame sin. He overcame evil. He conquered the grave once and for all. Friends, Jesus has already won. We have already won, for he did everything. He did everything necessary for our salvation. Jesus has broken every chain. He has set us free from all that would threaten us, from all that would hold us captive. So the outcome, according to Revelation, the outcome has already been determined. The victory belongs to our God, and his victory is our victory. And we can't deny, we can't deny that in the world and even in our own hearts that Satan continues to oppose the things of God. That he continues his spiritual assault on God's children. The enemy continues to accuse and to deceive. But we know from Revelation 12, here it is, it says that Satan is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. He knows His time is short. So all of the things that we see, evil, injustice, oppression, all of these things that are so real and so deeply embedded in this world, but we know, but we know they won't last. We know they have an expiration date. So church, I leave you with this final question. If God is for us, then who can be against us? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
thanks so much to to Ray for that. And I've always <clears throat> loved and just resonated with the the final line of that that hymn, "A Mighty Fortress Is Our God," which is, "And God Will Win the Battle." And so, friends, as we worship today, we know and we remember that God has already won. That Jesus is victorious. And I hope that you'll uh, take a moment uh, following our worship service. We'll have our breakout rooms open <laughs> if you'd like to join one of those uh, for a time of fellowship and say hi to some other uh, folks in the MPC family. You'll see an invitation there on a screen for you to join one of our breakout sessions. And now would you receive this final blessing? Friends, may the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the one who calls us is faithful. And he will do it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let all God's people say, Amen.